Peter Zopfe, in his Last Messiah, gave us a very poetic description of existential panic. And I would almost call it existential horror or existential aversion. Um, when a caveman discovers what it means to be human. <laughs> you would think that a caveman would just sort of instinctively know this. It's an interesting plot device that um, that uh, Zopfe used to, to indicate that it was a caveman who had done this, that had discovered what reality is and discovered what he was, and it killed him. Um, and I think that it's an apt one, because the caveman is supposed to be the one that's most in tune with what he is. I'm um, in my son's, uh, where my son's crib is, and behind me you'll see Genoi Oyos Si, which I've affixed directly to the wall, um, saying, become what you are, which basically is saying that, Sophie, it won't kill you, or it might kill many people, but it won't kill everybody. Um, some people seek out that moment of existential uncertainty or existential uprootedness or existential um, confusion. Some people understand or perhaps they see the universe in such a way that confusion is built right into it. That a um, lack of understanding, at least on an intellectual level, is part of what we are as humans. Um, Sophie seems to say that if we do actually pierce that uh, that illusion, if we actually shatter the illusion and see reality for what it is, it will kill us. Um, interestingly, that, that sort of idea of actually seeing reality and it being a poison is, or at least a danger, an overwhelming force that is too big for us to actually grasp is kind of hidden in metaphors throughout many philosophies. You see it in um, Plato's cave where you're told that if one of the cave dwellers is tossed up into the blazing sun, the shock of it may kill him. Um, we're told in the Bhagavad Gita that when Krishna gets Arjuna, the everyman, to see reality for what it is, he almost goes insane, and he probably would have gone insane if he didn't have Krishna there to help him uh, deal with the fallout from it. Um, <clears throat> we have things like the Hindu view of time itself as a open the, the open maw of a monster with all these horrible things flying out of it at us. Um, if we actually see reality and the stream of becoming and the eternal becoming of the universe for what it is, the shock could overwhelm us, kill us, and it certainly will horrify us. Um, what do we do about that? Well, again, go back to India. The Jains say, ignore it. Just stop responding to it. Uh, stop responding to the stream of becoming. Stop looking for anything in it. Um, that's one response, and I would call that, <clears throat> broadly speaking, life-denying. Uh, Nietzsche said that... Um, Christianity is inherently life-denying. I'm not sure I agree with him there, but I think that his experience with Christianity would have led him to conclude that. But I've seen some pretty life-affirming Christians in my time. Um, <clears throat> but Jainism and I think, uh, you know, things like Shakerism in Christianity or clerical celibacy in, in Catholicism or... Um, you know, all the things that St. Paul tells real Christians to do, don't get married, uh, that sort of thing. There's Western equivalents of that. Um, we also have um, the Gnostics. We have, um, even today, the Sophian-type antinatalists. Uh, you even see it in fiction. Um, Stephen King's novels are full of the horror of discovering things that are best left undiscovered. In fact, I might say that that's almost the entirety of horror literature is people who stumble upon things that they weren't ready for. <laughs> um, uh, the line, the first line from um, H.P. Lovecraft's The Call of Cthulhu comes to, uh, comes to mind, you know, one of the mer most merciful things in 
Uh, life is the inability of the mind to corollarate, or to corollarate and correlate all of its various parts, because if we did actually manage to do that, we'd go bananas, we'd go insane, our minds would be wrecked by it. Now, <clears throat> that's just about every tradition on earth covered there. <laughs> I guess we could go to the Chinese or the um, Muslim example of it, where, you know, in the Islamic case, await your reward after life, because life is really just an antechamber to everything that follows it. Um, we have uh, Benatar saying that um, whatever rewards life may have, they're so bad as to, they're so few, or at least so poor, as to make life not worth it, uh, worth living. Um, but what about those who seek all of that? Who seek the darkness? Uh, a lot of people seek the darkness, and they're not quite sure why. I see the young teenagers there, the trench coat mafia that every generation seems to spring up. Um, I guess the previous generation knew them as black emos or dark emos or something like this. In my case, in my age, they were just called the black people or the black the pe people who wore black clothing all the time. Um, it's unfortunate that that terminology gets mixed up with racial language, but it wasn't meant that way back in my day, eons ago. Um, people who are fascinated um, by the darkness, by, you know, Edward Scissorhands or things like this. They're not quite sure why, why they watch these zombie apocalypse movies or TV shows now. Uh, they don't know why they're fascinated by violence. They don't know why they're fascinated by the latest case of serial rape in the newspapers, but they are fascinated by it. But they don't want to face their fascination. And I don't blame people for that, because there is, I would call it a fear of infection that most people have, that they instinctively shy away from the dark. They want it safely in a book or on a TV show so they can go, with, go about their regular life having pushed it away from them um, in the course of watching these TV shows. And, generally speaking, the good guys win, at least on, in a general sense. Um, <clears throat> now, what do you do, though, if you're the sort of person to whom pushing that away doesn't work? And you have no desire to harm anybody or anything. You have no desire to inflict this point of view on the world, to act upon it or anything like that. You simply want to see it for what it is. Um, I've mentioned to everybody that, you know, I do have certain, I don't know what you'd call them, mental or psychological practices that I undergo. Um, simply to change my perceptions. If somebody followed me around with a camera all day uh, over the course of my life, they would say, what a dull average life this guy lives. Um, you know, but when I sit down to meditate or when I sit down to think, what am I thinking about? What am I, what am I, what's going through my mind? Well, stuff that most people would probably be terrified by and disturbed by. Um, I know myself, I know that I'm not ever going to even get the slightest desire to act on the darkness that I allowed to run around up there. Um, it doesn't frighten me the way that Sopface Caveman was supposedly frightened. Um, in fact, I think I've spent most of my life trying to accept the horrors of the world. And, I don't know, for some weird reason, as I get a few more gray hairs, and my hair thins out a bit more, even though I have let it let it uh, grow, it is thinning out, I sort of think, why can't we love it? Why can't we love necessity? Why can't we love inevitability, that which must happen? And horror and suffering seem to be inherent in our, in our existence. What is the problem with loving horror. We're afraid that if we do love it, we'll, you know, be overcome. It's Halloween, very appropriate. Uh, we would be overcome with the desire to go out and axe murder a bunch of people or, you know, do some other horrible thing. Um, we think that we're going to succumb to it the way that, uh, you know, 
Luke Skywalker's father did, or Saruman in the Lord of the Rings trilogy did. He studied it to try and deal with Sauron, and he eventually became sucked into it. Um, is that inevitable? Is that inevitable that that is going to happen? Um, even to powerful people, people who actually uphold the discipline, like Darth Vader or Saruman. Lucifer. <laughs> um, Lucifer has come down to us as an evil thing, but Lucifer is he who brings light upon things. <laughs> you know, lucid, lucidity. Um, <clears throat> is it simply that if we stumble upon these things unprepared and loaded down with pre- suppositions that it's going to destroy us. But if we understand what it is that we're dealing with when we wander into the forest primeval, if we know what's in there and we're, we're willing to face it, um, what is it then? Um, <clears throat> what happens to our fears when we face them? Um, I'm going to read something, a religious poem, I'm afraid, by Vivekananda, who was a 19th century Indian Bengali uh, Hindu philosopher, reformer, mystic, I suppose. The guy who more or less brought, single-handedly, lofty sort of egghead Hinduism to the West. Um, and he's writing a poem, as a Bengali would do of that epoch, about Kali, the mother. She is the universe itself. She's horr horrifying when you just first look at her, but if you actually understand her... In other words, if you manipulate your own experience of her, which we as humans do have the capacity to do she turns into something different. Now, if you've ever studied the culture of Bengal up to this day, the Hindu part of Bengal, West Bengal in India, Bangla, I think it's called now, um, the type of Hinduism that is practiced there is generally seen as somewhat disreputable in the rest of the Hindu world, but again, there's no attempt made to suppress it. It's just sort of, well, you know, those Bengalis, they, them and their radical ideas, you know, if they're not communists, they're fascists. If they're not atheists, they're tantrics and, you know, things like this. They just seem to be the ones who are always rebelling against everything and trying to be iconoclastic. It's also the place in India where the most original ideas tend to come from as well. But, um, Kali the Mother by Vivekananda. The stars are blotted out. Clouds are covering clouds. It is darkness, vibrant, sonant. In the, war, in the roaring, whirling wind are the souls of a million lunatics, just loose from the prison house. Wrenching trees by the roots, sweeping all from the path, the sea has joined the fray and swirls up mountain waves. To reach the pithy sky, or sorry, to reach the pitchy sky, the flash of lurid light reveals on every side a thousand, thousand shades of death begrimed and black. Scattering plagues and sorrows, dancing mad with joy. Come, O oh mother, come. For terror is thy name, death is in thy breath. And every shaking step destroys a world for error. Forever. Thou time, the all-destroyer. Come, O oh mother, come. Who dares misery love and hug the form of death? Dance in destruction's dance. To him the mother comes. A lot jammed in there. I think that it's a it's kind of a a poetic version of Zopfi's horror, moment of horror, when he looks into the face of existence and that's what he sees. Um if you don't like people using these sorts of metaphors to describe reality, i.e. religious ones, then I guess that we're going to have to criticize Zopfi for doing the same thing. And a lot of the other uh, life-denying types. <clears throat> if that's what we want to call them. Um, now, why would somebody choose that? Choose that kind of image? Kali. For the um, centerpiece of an ecstatic and intensely life-embracing point of view. I guess the point is, you have to see it for what it is. You have to look at reality the same way that Zafi's caveman does, the same way that one of Plato's cave dwellers will, and accept that that's what it is. Um, not just accept it, but love it. You have the capacity to love it. A lot of people will say that you're insane for having done it. Maybe. I won't say otherwise. 
Um, I think that, uh, again, like to use Plato's metaphor, the person who actually has discovered what reality is often does come across as, I think, at least a little bit to everybody else, because everybody else is living in the universe of form, the universe of assumed reality. We're living in a universe of Zafi's distractions and, you know, anchoring and all this sort of thing. Whereas Vivekananda is telling us, stare right into the whirlwind of becoming and formlessness and nothing ever staying the same ever, not even for the smallest microsecond. Uh, in fact, unchangingness, if you can use such a word, is kind of an irrational concept in the idea of becoming, in the idea of form upon form, horror upon horror, which is how Zafi describes it. Um, why do we sort of say automatically that, as Lovecraft does, discovering what reality is will kill us or drive us mad? Why do we say that it will do that in all cases? I don't think that it will, and I think that there are people who deliberately seek out the moment of existential truth, I guess, existential horror. Um, as I say, I, I'm into Tantra myself, but all that I tend to really do is ruminate on things and practice yoga. Uh, but that's a lot, actually, when you're, <laughs> when you're um, teaching yourself to think a certain way that is radically different from the way everybody else sees things. Um, and the first fear that you have to overcome, I guess, is the fear of infection by it, which I don't seem to have. And I, the older I get, the less likely I seem to be to be infected by anything that I'm that I'm getting into. This is an idea that has fascinated me my entire life. I guess Nietzsche would call it transvaluation. Uh, it's not countervaluation. You're not doing what you know the Ned Flanders sort of Zopfe sort of. Um, binary there. You're not embracing everything blindly and stupidly, and you're not, um, or it's not even, not really embracing it, but you're saying everything is great, and you're not, on the other hand, saying everything sucks. You're saying, well, everything may suck, and it may not suck. It might be wonderful, and it might be horrible at the same time, but it is at least possible to love it, warts and all. Um, and it's interesting that when you look at the sort of the, the Hindu version of life affirmation versus life denial. The life deniers tend to go along the same lines as the Abrahamic faiths. You got to get off the wheel of existence. You have to eventually wait till you die, till you're off. The tantrics say no. Only when you exist, when you actually occupy space, can you achieve what a tantric is trying to achieve. You're trying to experience reality for what it is and not be wiped out by it. <laughs> Um, and I think that's why tantric imagery is so filled with horrible images, horrible, horrible images that you, you will come across and you have to learn to deal with. Um, the book that I have is by Ajit Mukherjee, Kali, the Feminine Force, uh, one of the more sort of, I don't know, I always use the word egghead, but he's kind of an egghead view of tantra. Um, and tantra to me just seems to be all about controlling your experience of reality. You can't control reality itself, or you can't control all of it. Um, if you, When you get into that argument, when you get into that debate, how much of reality can you control? You get into that pointless, endless debate on free will versus determinism, which doesn't seem to ever go anywhere. Um, but there, do, there does seem to be things in reality that you can control, and there, there do seem to be things that you can't control. So, <clears throat> the stuff that you can control, what can you control? What can you control? What is it that you can control? Like, if somebody's going to say, I believe in free will, okay, then why don't you tell me, if you believe in free will, what your free will can control? Oh, I can't answer that because there's so many variables. Okay, what can you guarantee me that I can control? What do you what 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 aspect of reality of now can I control? Well, I would tell both a determinist and a free will type that we are in control of our experiences. Um, it's not 
an easy thing to do or necessarily a nice thing to do. But I think that we can do it. <laughs> um, I think that uh, that's kind of the aim of being human. It's, as I say, it's the exact opposite of the normal view of getting off the wheel of birth and death and that you get in all the um, Eastern faiths, Eastern religions, or whatever you want to call them, philosophies. Uh, Tantra says, no, <laughs> don't chase windmills there and then. Do it here and now. <laughs> um, you know, the old who seeks nirvana, says the tantric saint. Um, reality is enough, more than enough. But again, you have to pass through the fire, don't you? You have to sort of accept everything that comes your way. And as a Western skeptic, that's a bloody hard thing to do. We don't accept anything, ever. <laughs> Um, in fact, accepting that which is wrong with the world in our view of things may be, in many cases, makes us believe that we're complicit in the bad things in the world. Again, we're overstating how much we can control. If I'm not denouncing Adolf Hitler, I'm somehow uh, complicit in what he did. I, that thinking still exists in our, in our collective zeitgeist, in, our, in our, our collective discourse that we have as humans. I can't do anything about the fact that the Holocaust happened, but I still have to den denounce it and distance myself from it, even though it is completely and utterly outside of my control. That's kind of the crazy way that our ethics and our thinking is gone. Because if you get into things like love of one's fate, amor fati, well, look at, look at everything that's in there. <laughs> I have to kind of love the fact that I live in a live in a generation where there's been a few genocides, a few hellish disasters, the clash of civilizations, um, many wars, complete disorientation of the world in the way that we think. Postmodernity does that to us. We're, we are completely disoriented, and there's no up or down anymore. And we have to love that. We have to love that moment of primal confusion. A lot of people will, will be offended by that. You bastard. You love this mess? Ooh. Uh, hence, we have things like witch hunts and mass hysteria throughout our history. When we see things like images of Mother Kali, we go mad and we say, that's so terrifying, I have to push that away, regardless of what I what needs to be done to do so. And to and generally, in order to push away the bad side, we have to do things that are worse than pushing away the bad side. We have to build places like Auschwitz, or we have to tie people to stakes and burn them. We have to uh, denounce people as mad or insane, or fill our newspapers with endless litanies of horror and sadistic uh, activity just to constantly have it there for us to hate it and hate it and hate it. Um, it reminds me often of the two minutes hate in George Orwell's 1984. Um, you know, the, the denunciation that is inextricable from the advanced totalitarian state reminds me a great deal of how life acceptance is often viewed in, in you know, human society. You love all this stuff. You love the fact that we've got all this horror happening. You're not doing anything about it. Denounce, denounce, denounce. <laughs> what is in, at bottom the fear? What is it that killed Zapfi's caveman? What is it? What is the choice that we find ourselves incapable of making that leads us to be defeated by a glimpse of actual reality? What is it that we discover in reality that is so horrible that it is simply unlovable? A character in H.P. Lovecraft, one of his novels or short stories, will discover something that is so horrible and so impossible to prepare oneself for that one is destroyed by it. Um, is everybody guaranteed 
to either be destroyed or sucked in by dalliance with that kind of thing. I don't think so. Uh, I'm willing to stake my my life on it, I suppose. Um, but again, you're, you've got to understand what you're playing with here. <laughs> Is it possible to understand what you're dealing with? Um, the Gita says, no, not necessarily, because Arjuna says, yes, I would like to see reality for what it is. He sees the Vishvarupa, which is basically the entire universe condensed into one experience. And it almost drives him mad, and he wouldn't, he would have gone mad if Krishna hadn't been there to spot for him, I guess. Um, what is it that causes this? We live in a universe that's full of predators, full of diseases, full of death and destruction and wars and famines and all this kind of thing. What better time to do, to uh, think about this than Halloween? Because Halloween is the annual festival where we consciously reach out to the dark side. And we try to make it our own. We, try to, we, we dress up children as little monsters. That way we can sort of see the dark side. But because we see our children dressed as monsters, perhaps we somehow make these little monsters a little bit more manageable. Um, there's a lot of sexual imagery, especially in female costumes on Halloween. Why is that? Why is the dark side and sexuality so inextricable? You know, the Elvira, like... Uh, costumes that went off in the seas or French maids or things like this. What is that? Tantra is loaded with sexual imagery and sexual license, I suppose, is generally anathematized or at least attempted, at least there's an, at least an attempt to subjugate it in most life affirming views of reality. Uh, sorry, life denying versions of reality, the life affirming types almost overemphasize it. Um, Tantra and Kabbalah are loaded with sexual imagery. Um, to the point where, when you say Tantra now in most of the West, people assume you are talking directly about sex, which sex is a very small amount of it, but sexual imagery is, or sexual metaphor, suffuses the entirety of it. Are we afraid of sex? Are we afraid of the female? Are we afraid of the vagina? Are we afraid of the penis? I don't know. It's any number of things that could be said to generate this universe um, are brought out. Death generates the universe. Death is associated with fear and monsters. We tr dress children up as fear and monsters at Halloween to make it more lovable. Um, we have a holiday where it's acceptable, more or less, for women to go out dressed in what we would consider inappropriate be, uh, clothing most of the time. But it's, since it's Halloween, it's okay to walk around in lingerie. There is a germ of that in our civilization, I think. This desire to embrace the dark side, but only under very specific circumstances, very specific uh, times and places. Um, I think the assumption is that most people require that anchoring that Zapfi talks about. But only under carefully controlled circumstances, say the Feast of Fools or Purim, can we actually throw everything aside and act like the opposite of what we normally think is good. Saturnalia, where the ancient Romans would dress up like slaves and serve their slaves all day long. Now, if you understand how slavery worked in the ancient world, to do that literally is turning the universe upside down. Can you imagine a rich plantation owner in the deep south in the old days going out and picking cotton while his slaves sit inside and drink mint julep? That is exactly what the ancient Romans did. Um, <clears throat> what is that? The transvaluation of all values. Um, as I say, I think most of us are addicted to the view of the universe that we've created, this idea of order. But I think at the very instant of creating the order that really isn't inherently there, we are fear, we, we develop a fear of what happens when we abolish it. Life affirmation, I think, takes you by the hand and leads you towards that which you normally try to not look at. That which you're taught to be afraid of, and for good reason. Other humans might kill you. 
Um, in Plato's cave, it's implied that the guy who actually saw reality may end up getting lynched by his fellow prisoners if he's brought back down. A lot of people say that's what happened to Jesus, that's what happens to all kinds of people who come down and preach that they understand what reality is. I'm not going to get into that, but it, it is a recurring theme in human mythology. Kill the guy who knows too much. <laughs> um, kill him for the good of us all, even if what he's saying is correct. We still have to kill him. We still have to silence him somehow, even if it's just ridiculing him. Um... But again, e por si mueve, and, and yet it moves, and yet it still exists, and yet it keeps recurring. Um, again, the metaphor of 1984 comes to mind no matter how many times Manuel Goldstein's followers are shown to be complete idiots, heretics, their ide ideology completely unworkable, stupid, contrary to any established reality. There's a never-ending series of dupes, people who are constantly, um, constantly uh, seduced by it. That implies that, would we call it evil, has a staying power, that, um, that really nothing any human can do can stop. Um, we can't abolish evil from our lives. Now what? <laughs> well, we get off the wheel of existence... We sit down and we refuse to accept reality? Or we try to understand the, real, the wheel of existence and we try to embrace it? Um, it's obvious what my choice is. <laughs> and I think at 50 it's a little late for me to change course. I, I'm fascinated by how it's going to pan out um, in terms of my the canvas of my life as a whole, but... Um, so far, I don't seem to have had it destroy my life, and it does seem to have actually improved it in many ways. Uh, acceptance, I've discovered, at least for me, is not necessarily enough. Because acceptance can be sort of a grudging, sort of, uh, what's the point, it's always going to be like this. A cynical sort of resignation. How about loving it? How about embracing it? Um... Not acting upon it necessarily. Just because you love the fact that you live in this universe with all the horrible things in it doesn't mean you're going to do anything about that. Um, India is riddled with tantrics and Kali worshippers and all this sort of thing. Um, Chamunda and uh, Chinamasta and all these terrifying deities. But it's very rare that anyone ever does anything that... Uh, even remotely dangerous or illegal. Most Indians simply say, well, that's what they do. Uh, if they break the law, they'll presumably be arrested, but they don't break the law any more often than anyone else does. I just don't understand what their, what their point of view is, what their religious practices mean, but as long as they don't bother me. Indian society and Indian ethics have more to do with the social contract than with utilitarianism, so they're different from ours. I think that our civilization would do well to develop that kind of point of view and that kind of, I guess, discipline. Because as it is now, we have no discipline that enables people to get into the, the dark side and do something, you know, to embrace it. To embrace it not simply in and of itself, but as a totality of the universe. Uh, to love it. Um, and not to just sort of switch sides. Not to just go, bad is good and good is bad. Which I've always said is the mistake that Adolf Hitler and Walter Kurtz did from Apocalypse Now, but to simply say, I love everything, good and bad. In many ways, I think we're simply admitting to ourselves that we are humans. We're simply doing this when we do that. We're simply becoming what we actually are, and we're sort of signing an armistice in an internal war that can never be won between good and evil. Um, between darkness and light. If you want to believe in these polarities, they'll just keep fighting each other forever. Um, there's no indication that one side is ever going to defeat the other one. And maybe some sort of holistic view of things might be a saner option. But again, it's only a view. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a series of practices. It's not, you don't act on 
life affirmation. You don't act on uh, amor fati. You actually be a certain way. You actually control your experiences to the point where a love of fate becomes what you actually are. A love of your existence, a love of the universe for being exactly what it is. We may already do this. Again, Halloween comes to mind. But in a truly, I guess, all-embracing Amor Fati type um, view of the universe, um, we have to actively do it. We have to actively say, yes, this is precisely what I'm doing. We don't feed ourselves little tidbits of the dark side the way most people do when they watch zombie apocalypse. We consciously do it and say, I understand that, you know, zombies look terrifying. I understand that your face rotting and blood all over your lower uh, face and all over your chest and everything and cannibalism is pretty horrifying. But part of me is fascinated by that and approves of what that is because I keep going back to it <laughs> all the time. Why am I afraid? What is it in me that shrinks back from that? And how do I reassure that part of me that shrinks back from it? I think that might be the most important thing of all. How do I assure that when I dabble in this sort of thing, I'm not overwhelmed? Well, I think that most people simply are incapable of dabbling in it. They simply, they either dabble in it for the wrong reasons, or they, um, they will actually be sucked out into it, or they'll reach some state of horror, some sort of terrifying realization that they simply can't overcome. Or they believe that they can't overcome and, and have their mind blasted to atoms the way that Zafi's caveman had his mind blasted to atoms. Um, but, and yet it moves, as Galileo said. It's still there, frightening or not, horrific or not. It won't go away, but it won't overwhelm the side of light either. That, too, seems to be eternally present. <laughs> um, how do we embrace the dark without forsaking the light at the same time? Um, not an easy thing to do. But, you know, who said discovering the truth is an easy thing? Happy Halloween.